Hello, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. I'm standing in the front yard of my Portland, Oregon permaculture garden. We're in zone 8B here and we just finished having some epic hail. So you can see there's quite a bit of hail on the ground. So I have a front yard polyculture that is a mix of both edible plants and permaculture design and then those traditional kind of cottage garden plants like this lilac behind me. It's actually one of my lilacs that I want to talk about today. I'm having some problems that I noticed on it and so I thought I would share with you what's going on and what I'm going to do about it because perhaps you are having this similar issue. So I did a video last year where I talked about how to prune your lilacs and I featured these two lilacs here in my front yard for that video. One of them is doing really well. You can see lilac are just starting to bud out here in Portland in mid-April and it's doing great it's looking lush and beautiful just covered in healthy looking blossoms. but then I have this lilac next to it that is not doing so hot so let's take a look at what's going on the diagnosis and the treatment okay so as you can see the lilac in the background is doing very very well very healthy that's from a cutting this one up here I purchased at the Holda Klager Lilac Garden several years ago, and I can't remember the name of the variety. It started out as a little stick about this big with this tiny little root ball on it. And for years and years, it's done very, very well. And I like that I can keep it a little shorter than the one behind it. And I have these very bright kind of pale, pinky purple, exotic, heavily ruffled blossoms up here in the front, and then these kind of more simple dark purple ones behind. It's such a nice contrast. But this year I noticed that a number of my blossoms don't look so hot. They look kind of scorched. Do you see that? They're kind of brown. Oh, we'll let the city bus go by behind me real quick. They're kind of brown and scorched. And you can see these are an even better example. Ooh, that does not look good. Some of the tips also not looking good. You can see over here another example. The foliage is really, really struggling. So leaf buds and flower buds look kind of crispy and burnt and scorched. Here's another example. This is a great example down here. So what's going on here is Pseudomonas syringii. It is the lilac blight. This is a bacterial blight. And I usually try and be really careful about growing varieties of lilac that are resistant to fire blight and this one uh, I started it so long ago I was not really aware of what I was getting into and I didn't check to see if this was resistant or not I was just so enamored with how beautiful and that the blossoms on this are huge most years I was so enamored with it that I just bought it and it's done very 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 well for many years with no sign of disease so to see that it's looking like this right now when it should be loaded with just huge buds is really disheartening. Okay, so what am I gonna do with this lilac that is infected with Pseudomonas syringii? There's no chemical treatment, there's no spray that is gonna work and I wouldn't use one if there were anyway. I would find another solution that is not damaging to my body and to parts of my garden ecosystem and the wildlife that lives in it. So unfortunately, because we're looking at a bacterial infection here, what we have to do is remove all infected tissue. So let's take this infected piece right here. You need to remove all of the infected tissue and then down 12 inches below. So I'm gonna come all the way down here to make my cut and all of this material has to go. So that means a pretty heavy pruning for this lilac. A lot of the tissue is gonna get removed probably the whole shrub is gonna be cut back to about 18 inches off the ground. And then that infected material needs to be burned and not um, thrown back onto my garden. So normally I would take material that I prune that's healthy and I would chop it up and put it back on the garden as biomass that will then turn back into soil. But with something like a bacterial blight, you're gonna set up a system where you are cycling disease over and over because the bacterium can overwinter. It can persist all year long in the uh, in dead tissue, in the dead wood, if you leave it on the ground. So I don't wanna do that. What could I have done to prevent this infection? Well, as I said, plant resistant varieties. If you look on, uh, I think OSU, Oregon State Extension, has a list of varieties that are resistant to uh, the lilac blight. Other things, you do not want to fertilize late in the season. I don't fertilize at all, other than top dressing with more uh, compost and mulch. 
So that's clearly not what happened. Um, this, this variety has done very well for about eight years with no blight whatsoever. And so I think it was fairly resistant. But last year we had a terrible, terrible drought and these very burdensome hot spells. This, this shrub right here got quite a bit of sunburn. And I think that that was just enough of a stress on the plant that it's weakened enough to where the blight can get a hold. So I'm not gonna remove the whole shrub. I'm just gonna cut it back to about 18 inches off the ground, which is just killer, but I need to do it. And I need to get rid of all of that tissue. I wanna make sure it doesn't spread to the lilac behind it or any other lilacs in my garden or my neighbor's garden. So we're gonna see if that works. We're gonna see if we can rehab the plant. Usually taking off all of the infected tissue and discarding of it safely is the best solution solution and you can save the plant. So best to remove as much as I can right now before it spreads. So just remember with any pruning of infected material, you want to make sure that you sterilize your pruners before you touch any other plants or any healthy tissue. So again, I'm going to do that really heavy haircut. I'm going to safely dispose of the prunings and not leave any of the plant material in my garden. I am going to think in the future about making sure varieties that I plant are resistant to the lilac blight. And I'm going to make sure that I don't fertilize it heavily in the autumn. Again, I don't, but just keep that in mind for you late in the season. Don't give your lilacs a strong feed that makes them put out a spurt of new growth that is weaker and is more susceptible to blight. Also be aware that in the rainy season, it just spreads. If you live in a rainy area with a rainy spring, let this car go by. If you live in a rainy area like I do, um, I know I keep saying we're in a drought, we are, but also we get tons and tons of rain. Those water droplets splashing around can spread the bacterium around. That's why it's so important that you leave good air circulation. I also want to make sure when I'm pruning that I leave lots of space. Do you see how light and airy and open this lilac is? I don't want them to get too dense. I don't want there to be branches that rub on each other and cause wounds that can let the blight in. I don't want there to be a lack of air circulation. So having that wet tissue um, can be a cause of blight setting up house on your lilac. So I want to make sure there's good air circulation, room for my lilac to dry out, and that there's more space. Between lilacs, I also want to have the same setup. So I don't want two separate lilacs, this one and that one, rubbing against each other. I want to make sure I'm leaving plenty of room for good air circulation and reduced friction. And that way my plant is going to be more resilient to the lilac blight. Also, let's make sure when we are getting our varieties of lilacs and we're putting them in the garden that we are making sure there aren't any other undue stresses on them. I couldn't mitigate all of the stress of the tremendous heat dome that we had last year and the drought that we're in. But whenever possible, we want to make sure that our trees and our shrubs are supported for optimal health because when they are really healthy, they're fed appropriately. The soil has this healthy microbiome and our plants are getting the growing conditions and position in the landscape for um, peak success. They are less likely to be weakened and prone to disease. When we have plants that are stressed all the time, disease can move in and it can can take over in a way that it can't in a plant with healthy tissues and in a plant that's happy. So keep that in mind when you're putting something in your garden that if it is under a lot of stress, it's going to be more susceptible to disease. So thank you for watching today. I hope you will tune back in for more permaculture gardening and traditional cottage gardening as well. I have a Patreon down in the description if you are interested in learning about how to support this channel and the work that I do. Thanks.